Well, welcome to the Old Man on His Back Prairie and Heritage Conservation Area, which belongs to Nature Conservancy of Canada. It's got this very weird name, the Old Man on His Back, and there are several reasons why that we have this name. The first story is that they found an old man lying on his back there, and he was kind of dead. That's the first story. The second story is the ridge as you approach it from a certain direction is supposed to look like an old man lying on his back. But I've been driving these roads for 46 years now and either I have no imagination at all or somebody had a real wild imagination because I've never seen it. Another story is that there is a, a rock formation on top of that hill and if you look at it from a certain direction and a certain light and you squint and you use your imagination this rock formation is supposed to look like an old man lying on his back. And then on the wall here we have the native explanation of the name of the place and the story goes that Nappy was a Blackfoot warrior and he was wounded in battle and first of all he went to East End and by the time he got to East End his wound was infected and it's the pus in his wound that has formed a layer of white mud clay that goes through the East End hills and that white mud clay is still mined on a daily basis it's high quality porcelain clay and it gets taken into medicine hat, into Moldova potteries and used in the pottery making in there. And then Nappy walked from East End out to here and he lay down on his back to rest. So whichever story you remember, go with it. <laughs> That's my advice. We have a different formation of land around here. Um, it's not flat and you've got all these little mounds and hills and hollows and it's called Hamaki Moraine. And as the Wisconsin Glacier retreated thousands of years ago, a piece of glacier would break off and wash away the land underneath it. And that's what forms the kettle part or the bottom of these hills and the knobs or the, the hills that were left behind. The attraction to Nature Conservancy when they bought this place from Pete and Sharon Butella in 1996 was the fact that it's 13,000 acres in one block. And of that 13,000 acres, there were just over 900 acres under cultivation. So Nature Conservancy isn't in the business of farming. We maintain things in their native state or return it to its native state. So they had to come up with a game plan. And it took a few years. They called in the expertise of Nature Sask because they're the guys who know which grasses are indigenous to which area. And they called in Ducks Unlimited too for some help. And in, because we depend upon donations for our day-to-day -day operation, seeding native grasses is a really expensive proposition. And so we did it year, uh, you know, so many acres per year. Um, when we started seeding, and that picture there is the first chunk of land that was seeded back to native prairie. We had 10 different species in it, and it was, it's called warm and cool forbs, and all that means is some of the grasses start growing as soon as spring breakup comes and the other grasses start growing a little bit later. Uh, this was important for us because lots of this land was crown lease land and it was handed over to Nature Conservancy with the understanding that we stay as a working ranch. So we had to think about this grazing pattern for the type of grasses we were putting in. Seeding time for seeding native grasses the Ottoman time is a fall or late fall, so that it lies dormant for the winter and then it starts germinating as soon as spring breakup comes. What the experts tell us is in 50 years time, we won't be able to tell the difference between stuff that has never been broken, like the native prairie that's always been native prairie, and the stuff we've seeded back to native grasses. Uh, it would be really interesting to be around in 50 years time to see if the experts are right. We have lots of teepee rings in the whole area. Um, except for the places where people have cleared the land and, and farmed it. And I know our lease land has lots of teepee rings. The teepee rings, are, you find them on hilltops, and they were on hilltops for a reason. The winds blow and keep the mosquitoes away, and you can see wildlife approaching, and you can see your enemies or your friends approaching too. There is a picture there of, of a native encampment, and it's Big Bear's encampment, and it's taken at Cypress Lake, that picture. Big Bear and Nicanet were the last two chiefs in the Cypress Hills area. When the government was moving the natives out of the area so that the white man could come in and settle the land 
Uh, Big Bear did eventually leave. He stayed two years ahead of the law all the time, you know, trying to escape being moved. And he ended up in Batoche, and he was very involved in the Riel Rebellion, him and his son, Little Bear. Now, Nikonit stayed, and we have a Nikonit reservation to the southeast of Maple Creek. And when we do things out here, we involve the Nikonit. When this land was first dedicated to Nature Conservancy in about 1997, they came out and they built a sweat lodge and they smoked the sweet grass. And the, the sweat lodge, after they used it, the uh, framework for it was just laid down on the prairie, so it goes back to, you know, goes back into nature sort of thing. This part of the country was the last part of the province to become settled. Uh, we have settlers not coming down here until 1911, 1912 was the first time you hear of settlers coming down here. We are quite away from the main line, which was up along the number one. And they either got off the train in Gull Lake or in Maple Creek. And the main line went through Maple Creek in 1884, I think it was. And these guys who settled the land, they would get off the train and they would walk. Uh, some of them were lucky enough to be able to buy a horse right away. And every quarter section had already been surveyed here by Pallister and his crew. And every quarter section had an iron stake in the corner of it and with numbers on it, numbers of the quarter section. So you walked until you found at least one empty quarter. You usually had to find about six of these empty quarters you know, with nobody homesteading on it. And you walked back to the main, uh, the land's branch office, uh, and you filed a claim. And the reason why you went back with six, if you went back with one, usually the person that had filed on it previous to you, you met them on the road somewhere, or on the trail somewhere, and you got their no, somebody's already filed on that quarter. And to get your quarter section, which is 160 acres, to get it free and clear, you had to build a primary residence on it and live in it for six months of the year for three years. You had to break 10 acres of land for three years and you had to be over 18. And then, oh, you had to pay a $10 filing fee and that was it. And so if you fulfilled all those requirements, then that quarter section was yours. And so that's how this land got settled and there was absolutely nothing out here. Um, there was no trees to build houses. So there were lots of houses built out of sod, and I know our old original farmhouse was sod. And uh, it boggles my mind that people actually lived in stuff like that. But Grandma said it wasn't that bad, because the land out here is known as Rob Sark clay, and it gets like cement. And so you could sweep it and keep it clean. Uh, dirt is a really poor conductor of heat so in winter time it kept the heat indoors and in summertime it kept the heat out of doors the only problem was grandma said if it ever rained it would rain for three days longer indoors as it seeped through so everybody learned pretty quick as soon as possible to put tin on the roof and I see the picture on the wall here has tin on the roof and I know ours had tin on the roof and ours also had a slope to it, to it as well there's a picture there of somebody breaking the land with oxen. Now, oxen weren't used an awful lot in this country. Um, I know of three of the old homesteaders that had oxen and used oxen. Most people used horses because after you'd finished using the horses for pulling the plow and all the rest of it, then you still had something to hop on and go to town with or to pull the wagon to go and get your groceries or whatever. And then we come to the Butella story. And the Butella story is is really interesting. There were two brothers, John and Charles, and they came to North America in 1905 from Czechoslovakia. And they came to the States first. Now you'll find many people that have settled on this side of the border started off in the States, uh, frontier of the community just down the road. It seems like everybody settled there from Minnesota and they were all Norwegian because it's a very Norwegian community. In fact, we still celebrate Norway Day on May the 15th in Frontier. And so John and Charles, they eventually came into Canada after settling in the States. And they first of all went to Fernie and that's in BC and there's coal mines there and that's where they went to work was in the coal mines in Fernie. Now the coal mines in Fernie and the coal mines in Drumheller play quite an important part of our history. 
Remember I said you only had to be resident on your home, on your quarter section for six months of the year. Well, lots of these guys came to Canada with precious little money. And you needed money to be able to homestead and have no income for a few years. So they would fulfill their homestead requirements and then they would go off to the coal mines. John and Charles were at the coal mines in Fernie and somebody from around this area was at the coal mines in Fernie and told the Butella boys about all this free land into the Divide area. The town down the hill here was known as Divide. And you better come out and live a good, clean life of farming instead of down these coal mines and all the rest of it. So, so they came here in 1913. And John Holmes said the quarter that makes the corner where the road goes now. And the little old shack that's still standing in the quarter section opposite there, that was Charles's homestead. John came here with a wife and one son, and Charles came here as a bachelor. And Charles stayed a bachelor all his life. And John, before he was here much longer, he had another son. And in the meantime, George, the youngest brother, came from Czechoslovakia in 1913, and he went directly to the coal mines. He wasn't old enough, he wasn't 18 yet, so he couldn't file for a homestead. So he went to the coal mines in Fernie first, and then he worked in a cow camp north of Maple Creek. And he came here somewhere around 1921. But by this time, John and his family had had enough of farming. And they went back to the easier life of working in the coal mines of Fernie. And I can never figure that one out because to me that would be, that'd be worse than homesteading. <laughs> George bought that quarter off John. And he took this quarter that this place is on as his homestead quarter. And he built a little wooden shack to start off with. After a while, we had a, a one-room schoolhouse just to the northeast here called Snow Hill. And Alice Graham was the teacher there. And so George and Alice took up and they got married. George and Alice had three kids, Peter the oldest, and then Mary Jane and Nancy. Pete married a lady called Sharon Hoy. And Sharon became Sharon Butella, the writer. And she wrote, she's written quite a few books. One book that is pertinent to this area is called The Perfection of the Morning. And she wrote it uh, telling stories of the land here and the stories of the land in Easton where they have their main house. And then they talk about our bison or our buffalo. Words interchangeable, to be correct, they're plains bison. Um, Pete apparently always could visualize bison on this place. And the dream came true in 2003. In November of 2003, Elk Island donated to us 50 head of bison. Somewhere around 2008, 2009, uh, the University of Texas ATM, they had a genetic testing program going on in the States and they were testing the private conservation herds in North America. They came out here and we rounded up ours and they tested them all. Uh, they took hairs and they took um, blood samples and all those results came back and everything is still genetically pure plains bison, which is kind of neat. It means they are direct descendants of a herd that was known as the Pueblo Allard herd. Uh, this is a herd that came out of the States. Now, somewhere around 1878, there was a Pendarial native called Samuel Walking Coyote and his tribe were in the Idaho Panhandle and his tribe used to invite neighboring tribes for a buffalo hunt every couple of years. And he recognized the fact that the buffalo were disappearing and so he did something about it. He captured either four or five bison and over the year his little herd grew. He sold them eventually to a Charles Allard and Michael Pueblo who were already ranching in the Flathead Valley in Montana. And this herd grew quite a bit. And Michael Pueblo decided in the end he, he wasn't going to ranch anymore. And he approached the American government and the American government didn't want any part of it. So then he approached the Canadian government to buy them. And the Canadian government, yeah, she said, sure, yeah. So in somewhere between 1905 and 1907, he was given two years to get them up to Alcana National Park. And 
it took the full two years to get them up there because he would round them up and put them in temporary corrals by a railway siding and Buffalo Bay and Buffalo they'd break up so he'd have to round them up again and so he eventually got them up there and so this herd here counts as the elk Adam herd so then elk Adam was really happy to hear that these were still genetically pure um, for the simple reason they have wood bison on one side of the highway, they have plains bison on the other side of the highway, and they're surrounded by ranch land. So over the years, the question has always been, has there been any interbreeding going on? This showed that there wasn't. Uh, Wes Olson, who was the, uh, the park warden up at Elk Island for many, many years, and who was a real expert on bison, when he bought our 50 head down, he bought a sap skull, and it's something that was found out in the wild, uh, you know, in, of the park up there. And it's been weathered and the animals have cleaned it off and the, the internal bone structures have disappeared. And then when the centre opened in 2006, Wes bought us that other skull head and the cape. And I kind of think the cape looks as though it belongs to that skull. Um, you can see the bullet hole where that one's been intentionally killed. And it's been chemically cleaned. It's nice and white. The, the outer shells on the horn are still intact and the internal bone structure inside the nose is still intact. That that looks like a lace dolly that's wrapped up inside his nose, it's filled with tiny blood capillaries so that when the bison chase across the prairie when it's 40 below the air gets warm before it gets to their lungs so their lungs don't freeze and cows don't have that and you will never see a cow chase across the prairie when it's 40 below unless it's being intentionally chased by something. The cape it looks at it, it's a nice fluffy full cape and it's a winter cape and it looks as though it's been killed before December but before the end of December after that they start looking a bit shaggy just from wear and tear on them and, and them rubbing against fences and trees and stuff uh, the other wildlife we have up there um, some are on the threatened list and some are on the endangered list and there's a picture of a swift fox there. Swift fox were extirpated, which means they disappeared off the prairies. There was an old English couple called the Smeatons, and they're quite a remarkable couple all in their own rights. They took it upon themselves to reintroduce the swift fox. They had the help of the University of Alberta and the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And they went down to Colorado to get their breeding stock because they still have swift fox down in Colorado running wild. And they had an extremely successful breeding program. And this was the mid 70s, I would say, they, they started doing this. They started reintroducing the swift fox all the way from the foothills as far as Grasslands National Park. And I can remember going down to the PF pasture down here one night, and it would have to be the early, early 80s, 80, 81. And the University of Alberta girls were out here and they had a truck and it was full of cages of these guys and they were releasing them in this area. And over the years, they have reproduced and they are, they are here, not very many of them. And you kind of get to know where they are so that you keep your eye out for them. Um, they're about the size of a cat with a tail as long. And so when you see them run across the road in front of you, usually in the headlights at night, the first thing you do is look at the tip of the tail because the tip of the tail of the swift fox is black and the tip of the tail of a red fox is white. And that's how you tell the difference because they look like a really, really healthy coyote with a tinge of red in them. They're not red like a, a red fox at all, but they're kind of neat. Some of the other guys up there, uh, the Frugianus hawks, they're on the threatened list right now. We're extremely lucky around here. We're just about at the northern edge of their territory and we have lots of them around here. Uh, the greater sage grouse, well, that's a whole story into itself these days. And uh, they're few and far between. Uh, burrowing owls, they're on the endangered list. In the past couple of years, there's been a couple seen on here. But you see them and then you don't see them again. So, But that's the same as they are all over the place. The greater horned owls, we have quite a few greater horned owls around and it's something sometimes you don't want to see around in your yard if you've got cattle because if you've got cattle you've got bales and if you've got bales you've got lots of mice so you keep barn cats around and kittens are lunchtime for the barn owls. The marble godwit, that's that, that other bird over there, 
the very first year this place was opened, I noticed we have a spring down in that direction. And uh, there was only ever three around. But over the past few years, we've seen, I've seen quite a few more of them. So it's kind of neat. The, the, the big donors to this place. Um, you see Ipsco steel on there. All our fences here are made out of uh, drill stem. And uh, when we have our volunteer weekends for the past couple of years, we've been busy putting caps on top of them. Um, we have a really interesting research program going on here right now. It's been going on for about, I think it's six years now. Um, his name is Dr. Kevin Allingson, and he works for the World Wildlife Federation out of the States. And his research is grassland birds, the effect of uh, bison grazing versus cow grazing. Uh, he came up with the interesting uh, topic here a couple of years ago, and it's research that had been done down in the States. And fences that are made out of pipelines, you find songbirds down the bottom of them because they accidentally fall down there or fly down there or whatever, and then they can't get out. So we're in the process of very slowly, bit by bit, putting caps on the tops of all these steel posts. And we get people that want to see the bison and want to know more about the bison. And then we get farmers and ranchers who are interested in our grass seeding program. And there's others that are um, Nature Conservancy donors, you know, on a permanent basis. And, you know, they read about it in the magazine. So it's, it's people like that that want to come here and, and, and see for themselves what we're doing. And they go away very satisfied. There, there is a spot here, and I call it Pete's Hill. You walk to the top of that, and I can see Frontier, and I can see way north, and I can see the Bear Paws, and I see our yard. And, and you can sit up there, and even if the wind's howling, it's, you're the only person around. And it's, it reminds you of how insignificant you are, and how, how little you matter because this stuff has been here forever. So, and it's, I don't know, I just find peace out here. It takes somebody else to point something out to you. You don't appreciate what you've got until somebody else points it out. Because when I became interpreter here, the very first year, Nature Conservancy bought half an island off the coast of Vancouver Island. And I was tickled pink that they were saving it from being developed and because the developer wanted to make it into a resort and I thought oh this is kind of neat it's going to be kept as, a, as an island and we had somebody that lives on on Gabriola or one of those islands off the coast there and I was saying how wonderful it was and she turned to me and she said what for it's just another island and it was just a real light bulb moment for me and I'm thinking ah you don't know what you've got till you somebody else points it out and it's true because you have to, coming from England, you think of pretty and picturesque and all the rest and beauty like that. But with a land that's so desolate as this with no trees, you look for beauty in a different way. You see the land differently you, and you see it in different lights at different times of the day and different sunsets and different sunrises and different moments. And you appreciate it not necessarily for the big overall picture, but just little bits of it. And, and you see little wildflowers growing in something and you see beauty in a totally different aspect and you appreciate it for different reasons. The night sky here, it's immense. And I quilt, so I, I look at fabric. And I look at the sky and I see all these amazing pictures there and you can take examples from the sky. And it's a never ending changing sky. Uh, it's never the same. Uh, the cloud formations are different. You can see weather coming in from miles and miles away. If you can't see the mountains of a morning, you know you're in for some sort of weather system or something like that. And it's just so immense, the vastness of it, and the fact that you can maintain things in your native state and make it work. You know, and it is worthwhile you know, donating or selling stuff to any sort of conservation organization. Because, you know, it is disappearing.
Hi, I'm Mark Wartman. I have the privilege of being the Regional Vice President for the Nature Conservancy of Canada in Saskatchewan. And I'm uh, really thrilled to have an opportunity to help conserve really critical habitat across this province. Since 1962, from humble beginnings in Ontario, uh, we now have uh, almost 2.8 million acres of land across Canada. In Saskatchewan, we have 140,000 acres of land, 100,000 which is under conservation agreement in partnership with farmers and ranchers, and 40,000 which is land that we own. This is made possible by significant donations by federal and provincial government, by organizations like Sask Energy and Canna, Nexon, and uh, by individuals. Uh, people who have been campaign leaders for us, like David Dubay and Heather Ryan from Saskatoon, have made all this possible. Without those donations and uh, even support from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and their foundation, and from the North American Wetlands Conservation Agreement, uh, we're able to purchase this land and we're able to steward it and make sure that it is cared for in perpetuity. We welcome a variety of groups to come out, whether it's individuals or school groups, uh, researchers, to come onto the land uh, basically by foot and uh, really experience the beauty and diversity of nature, which is truly life-giving. Uh, it's hard to uh, explain the experience of coming out into a piece of natural prairie and hearing the wind blow through the grass, uh, seeing the sights. And one of the best places to experience that is the old man on his back ranch, 13,000 acres of land, part of it donated, part of it purchased from Peter and Sharon Butella. And uh, it's an amazing property. The donations are a vital part of making this happen. Uh, whether it's individual donations, whether it's bequests, and we've had gifts anywhere from a few cents to millions of dollars that have enabled this to happen. We've been listed by uh, Money Sense Magazine, by the Financial Post, as Canada's top environmental charity. And it's because of the work that we do to make sure that the money gets directly to conserving the land. Of the money that comes in, 83% is applied to conservation actions. Standing here in this beautiful landscape, I can't help but think how we wouldn't have it were it not for the thoughtful generosity of people who've made significant donations. We need those donations in order to be able to do effective conservation work. Think carefully. How can you help this conservation work to continue to develop in Saskatchewan? How can you help care for this land that is so vital and critical? How can you make sure that your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren will be able to experience the beauty of these surroundings? Your donations do make a difference. Thank you.